Thank you very much, Claudio. Good afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Max. I'm coming from a Swiss LLM. We are a Zurich-based uh, startup focusing on uh, Gen AI-based solutions, and uh, I'm happy to introduce you to the topic of retrieval augmented generation in the next 15 minutes. Try to keep it short so we have time for the panel. So most of you uh, may know already what uh, large language models are. Uh, it's a technology that is behind uh, uh, ChatGPT and other solutions you may have uh, tried out in your private maybe already. Large language models are trained with uh, huge data sets, billions and billions of data points uh, from the internet, uh, text data, image data, audio data. Uh, and in order to uh, really use a large language model, you have to fine tune it in order to uh, have it do some specific tasks like uh, information retrieval or instruction following or image detection, as we have seen in uh, the speech of my colleague uh, beforehand. You can compare this a little bit to the training of a dog, right? So each puppy goes to a dog school, he knows to sit, he knows to down, he knows to come, but as soon as you want to, your dog to do very specific tasks, like for example being an assistance dog or being a police dog, you have to uh, send him to a specialized school. This is what you do when you fine-tune a large language model. Still, if you want to use uh, large language models for use cases, as we have seen in the previous three talks, you have uh, to connect it to your own data. So even if those uh, large language models have been trained with billions of parameters, they have no knowledge about your company, they have no knowledge and no access to your company data, and uh, they have no uh, domain-specific knowledge about uh, energy utilities, for example. So this is where retrieval augmented generation comes into play, where you can connect your own data and your company data to large language models. So a uh, retrieval augmented generation uh, process can look very simple. Maybe a few of you have already uh, tried it out, uh, created a few uh, pilot projects. So basically you take documents from your company and you ingest them into a vector data bank and then you do a retrieval, meaning that you embed the query into the same vector database and then you look for similar documents with uh, techniques like cosine similarity, for example, and then you send the query together with the uh, retrieved context that is based on your data to a large language model to perform specific tasks or to answer <coughs> questions. Um, this works very well if uh, we're uh, talking about a single document but in a context of energy utilities, such uh, or also other uh, companies, we're not talking about uh, a few documents. Usually we're talking about ten of thousands or millions of documents. And uh, if you just take all those documents and you ingest them, like we have seen before, the outcome will not be very uh, relevant or useful. So you have to undergo a few more steps in this retrieval augmented generation process in order to handle big data, so data uh, that, is, that has a high variety, high velocity, or uh, high volumes. And uh, I will present you some of those techniques that you can use in order to make your retrieval augmented generation pipeline really performant. Let's start uh, at the beginning. So before ingesting your documents, it's important, as uh, you may know, in all uh, machine learning uh, applications to um, properly uh, parse and cleanse your documents. You should transform the different kind of formats and documents you're working with in a standardized format, such as, for example, a JSON format that is easily understandable and machine readable for a large language model. And then you can also augment your existing data. So augmenting data means that, for example, you take your documents and you create single facts out of your documents. So documents usually are very long, very complex. If you just send them to a large language model, even if they are very intelligent, the large, the large language model gets quite confused. So out of a long document, you should start and create 
uh, single propositions, single facts, and then you can, for each fact and proposition you have generated, generate hypothetical questions. So questions that could or can be uh, answered based on those facts. So you do this on one hand to augment the performance and quality of your retrieval process, but you can also use this data set of questions and facts in order to fine tune the embedding model. So an embedding model is a machine learning model, is an algorithm that you use to create vectors out of different kind of format, data formats or texts that you then store, as we have previously seen, in a vector database. So if you fine-tune such an embedding model based on your own data, the embeddings have a much higher quality and the similarity within the vector space is much higher than if you just use an embedding model out of the box. Another uh, quite uh, interesting technique is uh, before you actually start the retrieval process, so before you search for relevant documents that you may send as context to your large language model, you can transfer, transform the queries. So the quality of an answer or the quality of an output depends very much on how you ask something. So some people are better at asking good questions, other people have like uh, some difficulties or no time to ask a good question. So maybe in the context of energy utilities, if someone would ask how can I decrease costs, the large language model would have quite difficulties even using your data and your documents in responding that question. So you can send this original question to a large language model to create transformed queries out of this question. So more specific questions, for example, such as how can I decrease operational costs, or how can I decrease uh, maintenance costs, or how can I decrease uh, integration costs for renewables. So now you have all those different queries and transformed queries. You have your vector data bank with all the uh, documents and informations that you have stored. And uh, you can use then different kind of retrievers to actually go into that vector data bank and retrieve the most relevant information. Uh, I don't have time and I will not go uh, into each of those retrievers, but each, each retriever has a very specific task. So you have retrievers, for example, to uh, uh, query and retrieve uh, tabular data in SQL. In a SQL data bank, you have retrievers to access and uh, search for information in a knowledge graph that may be stored in your vector data bank. And uh, you can use other retrievers such as, such as a classical BM25 retriever to, um, to retrieve the most relevant documents. What you get out once you have gone through all those different retrievers is a big list of all the documents that you have ingested, indexed in your vector data bank that can or could be used to answer the query. This is still not enough because if you send such a huge amount of documents to a large language model, uh, it again has difficulties in responding the, 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 the question. So uh, some, some, some language models have a very big context window, so you could potentially send hundreds or thousands of documents to this large language model. Others have really small context windows, so uh, uh, they are only able to um, work with uh, maybe 10 or 20 different kind of documents. So this is where another technique comes into place, which is taking place after the retrieval. So once you have your big list, your big list of different documents that could be, uh, that could be used, you send all of those documents to another specialized model, which is a re-ranking model that takes and analyzes all of those documents and creates a ranking to um, define the most relevant documents that are needed to 
answer a question or to perform a specific task. So now finally, you have the relevant and the most relevant documents you can take and send to your large language model together with your query in order to get a very high quality answer out of it. Uh, here you can see just if you compare the different techniques, right? So if you would ask a, a plain large language model, even a very performant one, like for example uh, the ChatGPT4 model from uh, OpenAI, uh, if you ask it very domain or company specific questions, the quality of the answers you get from that model is not very high. Sometimes you get the right answer, in most cases you don't get the right answer. If you uh, apply just the most basic and simple uh, retrieval augmented generation pipeline as I have presented at the beginning of my talk. The quality gets a little bit better, but still not good enough, especially in the context of uh, energy utilities. And if you undergo all those different steps and uh, techniques and methods to work and improve your retrieval augmented generation uh, process, the answer quality uh, gets very high. You may ask how do we measure this? Uh, we measure this case by case. Basically, we are using a ground truth. So let's say a, a, a data set, a, go, a gold standard data set with uh, questions and perfect answers that we then compare to the outputs of the large language model. We use different metrics then to measure the quality of the output. Basically, you distinguish between the quality of the retrieval process, so how well does the system find the relevant documents, and then you measure the quality of the mm, answers that have been generated by the large language model. Now, what's the potential of all this for energy utilities? I'm not from the sector, so beg me pardon, <laughs> but I still tried to um, uh, show you a little bit what's the, what, what, what's the power of such a retrieval augmented generation process. Basically, it's, uh, it gives you the possibility to, to make a lot of data usable that has not been uh, usable until now. So we're talking about very heterogeneous data that may lie in very uh, different data sources that has very different formats, such as uh, energy health, um, energy consumption, reports or infrastructure health reports or even uh, geographical data, topological data from geographical information systems. Uh, uh, using this process, you can also use uh, unstructured data, so data from customer emails, from maintenance logs, etc. Uh, very interesting topic is also the multimodality. So large language models can not only work with text, they can also work with uh, images, or audio logs, and uh, as we have seen, smart meters and grid sensors is a big topic right now for energy utilities, so you can also integrate data from those sources in real time into your AI system. Some of, use, some of the use cases, the classical ones, obviously, is the, is, uh, the improved customer support, uh, where you can automate a lot of your customer service and communication, I think for energy utilities, especially the workforce uh, development and support is, um, is a very interesting topic. So people can have a, a knowledge database, they can query how do I perform certain repair or maintenance tasks for employee training and support. Operational efficiency can be improved, the grid management can be supported, like for example detecting anomalies or doing some risk estimations and um, also uh, regulatory compliance can be somehow supported. So you can, for example, uh, analyze if your regulations are compliant to the uh, regulations from different regions, from different countries. All of this can be automatically detected by large language models that have been improved with your own data. Some of the challenges, obviously the data must be consolidated, so you have still to um, uh, load and transform, uh, extract all the data from the different sources in order to make them usable 
for the rock pipeline. The topic of reliability is very important. So most of you may have heard that the large language models tend to hallucinate, so make up answers that are not correct. Those hallucinations can be drastically uh, reduced using the retrieval augmented generation methods, the topic of privacy and security. So um, a lot of your data you may use in such a ROC pipeline is uh, internal or sensible. So um, it's important to uh, use like open source uh, large language models that you can host on premise on your own infrastructure and also maintain all the role based accesses uh, in order to ensure that only the people that should have access to some information get actually access to it. And all of this then must be integrated, so uh, it's uh, the, the so like with all artificial intelligence tools, they must support the business and the processes and the humans and not disrupt them. And uh, to close, I mean, from my point of view, two takeaways, right? So you should all, uh, as energy utilities, continue to support research, uh, for example, by providing also data. There's a lot, uh, still a lot to be researched and to be done. And uh, don't be afraid. Start pilot projects. Don't try to immediately automate your most critical business processes. Maybe start small and from there on expand and um, make your experiences. That's it. If there are any questions, 